Let's open our Bibles uh, once again to the book of Ephesians, chapter 2. We're going to uh, read through verses 1 through 10 this morning. Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. have the amen corner firing up for me, and I love it. <laughs> Ephesians 2, 1 through 10, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, or walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Alright, today um, we come to the third part of our study of Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Uh, the first part was looking at the spiritual state of the Ephesians before they were saved. Paul speaking to them in the past tense, saying you were dead in your trespasses and sins. And this is the universal condition of all human beings. We are born sinful. We are born with a sin nature in Adam, uh, being his children, in which we are set against God in our sins. Paul reminding the Ephesian believers that's who you were before Christ. And it reminds us of who we were before Christ, or who we are apart from Christ. That was part one. Part two was where Paul, in verses four through six, looked at the change that God made in them. And he outlines that again in verses four through six. It's the great work of God's redeeming grace through His Son, Jesus Christ. And it's the same grace that saves today. It's the same grace that saved your grandparents, your children, uh, your future descendants you'll never see uh, on this side of heaven, those who come to faith in Christ. And then today... And we come to the third part, which is, why does God save sinners? What is the purpose for God's grace being displayed in this world today? And that takes us to verses uh, 7 through 10. And so let's, let's kind of gather our thoughts and, and ask the question, why would God save a sinner when he would be perfectly just in condemning us. So if, if God didn't save anybody, if God didn't have a redemptive plan, if Adam and Eve were the one and only trial, if Adam fails, then all hope is lost for humanity. God would be just in condemning Adam and all of Adam's offspring. Now, if, you, if you really wanted to kind of slap you in the face, Every human being deserves hell. Hell is what? Hell is the just wrath of God poured out on sinners. God would be perfectly just in condemning all of us. That's what we should be reading. But that's not what we read. We read that there was a second Adam who has come to redeem sinners unto God. And so the question is, but, but why? Why does God save sinners? Well, the answer must come from the Bible. And I think the, the first answer, and I read it here for us uh, in verse 4, this is the answer. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, made us alive together in Christ. So you can answer the question, why does God save sinners, by saying... It's because God loves sinners. We know the Bible tells us that. Jesus himself said in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world. 
that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Why does God save sinners? Because He loves sinners. And He loves to save sinners. 1 John 4.16 says this statement about the, the nature of God being love. God is love. God is the perfection of love. Human beings can demonstrate love, express love, but God Himself is love. And we know that God loves to save sinners. Now, that's probably not the main reason why God saves sinners, though. I think there is an ultimate reason, and all these other reasons like love come in under that, and I think the ultimate reason, the main reason why God saves sinners is for His own glory. And that takes us to Ephesians 2.7. Now this is, again, prior to verse 7, verses 1 through 6, Paul has told the Ephesians, reminding them who they were without Christ, dead in their trespasses and sins, under the judgment of God. Then he brings in the grace of God that has saved them. And in verse 7 he tells us why. So that in the coming ages He, God, might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. This is the ultimate reason why God saves any sinner. It's to bring glory to Himself. Throughout all eternity, every sinner that Christ has saved will bring glory to God the Father just by our very presence in heaven. Just by sinners who have been saved by Christ, being in heaven is a testimony to God's saving power and all that glory goes to God for what He has done. And you think about heaven, you ask yourself, what is heaven? Well, heaven's where God lives. Heaven is the abode of our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But there's another group of people, beings in heaven, holy angels that didn't fall and became demons. Satan uh, rebelled against God. He took a host with him. They rebelled against God. God cast them out of heaven. So when you think about heaven, you're thinking about the abode of God and His triunity, Father, Son, and Spirit, and you're thinking about the holy angels that live in heaven. And so heaven is the place of holiness. There's nothing unholy. There's nothing sinful. There's nothing evil in heaven. The demons have been cast out. There is God who is holy and there are the holy angels. But then, you find sinners there. Of all thing, things, why are sinners in heaven? We're not holy. By nature we rebel against God. What is sin? Sin is breaking the commandments of God. Sinners are by definition outlaws. We are without the law of God. We want not the law of God. We're lawless rebels. What in the world are outlaws doing in heaven? Outlaws should be in prison. And in biblical terms, outlaws should be in hell. So in this massive display of God's holiness that is heaven where God dwells and where the holy angels dwell, we find outlaws there. We see something that shouldn't be. How is that even possible? How can sinful people enter heaven? Well, if you look at the sinners that are in heaven, you find that they are forgiven sinners. And if you keep looking at these forgiven sinners, you find that not only are they forgiven, but they are no longer guilty. They are justified sinners. So we're forgiven of our sins, our law breaking, but we're also declared just before God. How can this be? How can outlaws become before God as if we were never outlaws? How are sinners forgiven? How are sinners justified before a holy and righteous God? And the Bible, the Old and New Testament, point to the only answer, and that answer is Jesus Christ. 
The Bible teaches us that when the Son of God, the eternal Son of God, came to this earth as fully God and fully human, He came not only to die on a cross atoning for our sins, but He also came to live a sinless life for those whom He would die on the cross. So if we look at the cross, we see the reason why the Son of God became human. He never lost His divinity in His humanity. He, is, he has two natures. He has a divine nature, the eternal divine nature of the second person of the Trinity. But at the incarnation, when Mary conceived the Christ child miraculously by the Holy Spirit, Christ then had a human nature. And being fully man, He was tempted. The Bible tells us that He was tempted. But He did not sin. And so the replacement for Adam, the new Adam, the last Adam, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, lives a sinless life, goes to the cross, and on the cross, God puts our sin on His Son. And then the Father pours out His wrath on His Son for our sins. Jesus bearing our sins before the Father's wrath atones for our sin. The guilt, uh, the penalty has been paid in, in Christ. So... All of our sins that we will ever commit, past, present, and future, have already been atoned for on the cross. They are dealt with. They are forgiven. Debt is canceled. If you're saved, you know that your sins are forgiven because of Christ. You don't pay that price anymore. The price has already been paid. However, just as our sins were imputed to Christ and atoned for on the cross by Christ, when Jesus, before His death, lived in this world, He lived a sinless life in thought and in action, completely sinless. And just as God imputed our sins to Jesus, God imputes the righteousness of His Son to us justifying us. And so when God looks at us, He sees, number one, that our sins are forgiven through Christ, and number two, He sees us as perfectly holy because He sees the imputed holiness of Christ in our place. And that's how outlaws can be in heaven. We are forgiven, and we are justified before God. And that is good news. Every sinner's salvation brings glory to God. The cross brings glory to God. The forgiveness of our sins in Christ brings glory to God. Our justified standing before God brings glory to God. Our presence in heaven brings glory to God because it all points to God and what He has done to save a people unto Himself. This is what the two Ephesians says by way of why does God save sinners? To show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So instead of treating us like rebels and outlaws, instead of giving us justice in hell forever, God relates to us through His Son, through grace, showing His kindness toward us in saving us. Now this Grace and kindness, in verse 2-7, you cannot measure. Paul says it is immeasurable. And every sinner in heaven is in heaven not because of anything that they've done, but because of everything that God has done through His Son, Jesus Christ. Look at verses 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. The it is the gift of God. The it in that statement refers back to the grace and the faith. Verse 9. Not a result of works so that, so that no one may boast. When we are all together on the last day, 
when Christ comes and resurrects our bodies and joins our soul to our glorified body and we are in the presence of the Almighty, not a single redeemed saint will have anything to boast of except for Christ. And God gets the glory. Verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And that's the topic for next Sunday's message. How do we glorify God in our life? So we can say with all assurance that the reason outlaws are in heaven the reason that God saves sinners is because He loves them. He loves us so much that He sent His Son to die for outlaws. But we know that the ultimate reason behind God's redemptive purpose is to bring glory unto Himself. Now when we bring glory to ourselves, that's sin. Because it's rooted in pride. But when a sinless, holy God brings glory to Himself, it is the right thing to do because He alone is pure and holy and righteous and worthy of all glory from all of His creation. When we stand before God, we will know that we are there only because of His redeeming grace. As we close, I want to ask you another question. This is the second. First question was, why does God save sinners? Why does God redeem outlaws? We've answered that. Second question, and the last question is this. Do you believe that God is worthy of all that glory? Do you believe that the Almighty is worthy of the glory of creation? He created it, and it points to Him, and it glorifies Him. Do you believe that your life should be lived to glorify God? Do you think that God is worthy of all glory and worship? Because we are a worshiping people. Human beings worship by nature. God created us to worship Him. Sin separated us from Him. And so we worship the creature instead of the Creator. So it's not a matter of, I don't worship anything. It's who do you worship? Do you believe that God is worthy of all glory and worship? Do you believe, I guess this is the second question. Do you believe that glorifying God for an eternity in heaven is what makes heaven heavenly? Is it okay for you, does it sit well with you to think that heaven is nothing but an eternity of worshiping and glorifying God? If you say that it is, then I'll ask, I guess this is the third question. Does your life on earth show that you think God is worth all glory? We spend so much, and the point I'm trying to make here is that we spend so much time seeking to bring glory to ourselves, seeking to bring glory to our children, our grandchildren, to other people. We spend so much of our time, our energy, our treasure ensuring that we receive glory in this lifetime, or that our children receive glory, or that through our children or through other people we receive glory. Now, it's one thing to make sacrifices for their well-being, but it's altogether another thing to sacrifice so that they get the glory, so that we get the glory. You can be sure that when you spend your life glorifying yourself, then the God that you worship is you. You can look in the mirror and you can see the thing that you worship, the idol of your heart. You worship yourself, and you seek to bring glory to yourself. But if we turn away from that mirror into the mirror of God's Word, we find one who is altogether worthy of all of our worship. And that is the God of our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, the God who has saved us, and the God who will bring us home. He is the only one worthy of worship. He is the only one worthy of a life that has lived to glorify Him. And His children must live to glorify their Savior and Lord. And we will consider that again in verse 10 of Ephesians 2 next time. I will come to a complete stop here. 
again by emphasizing do you believe that the Almighty is worthy of all glory? And if you say, I, I don't think so, but I know I'm going to heaven, I would say, if you do not believe that God is worthy of all glory, and you can tell if you believe that or not by what you spend your life glorifying, if heaven is non-stop eternal worship and glorying of the Father, and that's not your main thing now, then why would you want to spend eternity in heaven doing it? I would say this, if there's no love for God now, no longing for God, no desire to worship God, no desire to worship God with His people on this earth, no living today for the glory of God by obeying His Word, then you won't have to worry about doing those things in heaven because you won't be there. And so we'll tie up this package next Sunday by looking at how we can glorify God with our lives on this earth. What is the testimony of your life? Is it about God? Or is it about you? Our God is a jealous God. He will not share His glory with another. He will not tolerate the worship of another God. If we call ourselves Christians, then let us worship Him alone. And let us live lives that glorify Him. Father, we thank You for Your Holy Word. And Father, we ask that You would forgive us for our idolatry. How prone we are, God, to turn away from You into other things. How wicked we must be, Lord, when we turn away from You to self. And we seek to live our lives for ourselves when you are alone worthy of the glory that you deserve. Strengthen us in our hearts and in our faith and in our thinking. Let us be vessels separated unto you for your holy purpose in this world. And then, Lord, when our life is done, when you call us home, that we can bow before you and worship you forever. In Jesus' name, amen.